also gave it to his companions. And then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, and by the way, that means men and women, it was made for man and woman, not women and men for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I was remembering um, the retreat that I spent, a 30-day retreat at a, uh, a Jesuit retreat house in Colorado a number of years ago. And um, there, was, there was the uh, worship service every morning and there was the communion and the liturgy. And although I was not welcome very much to the liturgy itself, what was interesting to note was that the priest was required to drink what was left in the cup so as not, you know, so as not to waste something that was holy. Same thing went for the host, the little wafers that they had. And, you know, if, if he would try to count up just enough and so that everybody could have one, and if there happened to be a little too many, he would eat those and, and wash that horrible, awful plastic taste out with, 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 a, with a drink of wine. They, that was holy and set aside for God's purpose only, much like that consecrated bread. And Jesus is saying, hey, David did it. They were hungry. God didn't kill them. God would approve of that action. And that's what he's saying today. And Jesus' words were similar to the words of other Jewish teachers in this time. But what was so disruptive was his comment in which he equates himself not only to King David, but also to God. He was equating himself with God by saying that the Son of Man sits in that seat. He wasn't violating the Sabbath because the Sabbath was about restoration and empowerment. Story two is another time when Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and healed a man with a shriveled hand, all the while being watched closely by the Pharisees. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent, and he looked at them, and he looked at them in anger and was greatly distressed, and he said to the man, who was really put on the spot, he hadn't asked to be healed, Jesus calls him up and, and and Jesus says, stretch out your hand. And he stretches out his hand, and it was completely restored. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. We are two chapters and six verses into Mark's gospel, and they already want to kill Jesus. I'm reminded of Aslan, the Christ figure in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Narnia in this case a make-believe, made, made up place, had been under control of the White Witch, who had turned it into a freezing, frozen land where it was always winter and never Christmas. And there was a rumor that Lion, or that Aslan, the Roaring Lion, was on the move to redeem and restore Narnia. Little Lucy hears about this lion She's afraid, and she says to Mrs. Beaver, is he, Aslan the lion, safe? And Mrs. Beaver says this, of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Our big wills, rules of not going beyond the logs were important for our three and four year old sons. They needed to learn safety. The rule kept them safe for children. But if we had kept those law rules in place for this long in their lives, they might have been safe, but it would not have been good. <laughs> so I have to ask the question, how might we be keeping the church safe rather than good? How do our rules, both written and unwritten, keep us from feeding and healing people who are hungry for life? I heard a story a couple weeks ago told by a pastor about an elderly woman 
a member of the church who got locked out of her car at a Walmart store somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line. I will say no more, but I will say it was not in Woodstock. This woman was frantic. She went into the store looking for help, and three young people with weirdly colored hair, body piercings in their noses and lips and you know, all over their ears, and multiple tattoos, and dressed strangely, came to her rescue. She was so thankful that she invited them to come to church. They did on the first Sunday of November of a presidential election year. And uh, they dressed in all of their flamboyant glory. During the sharing time in worship, an elderly gentleman got up, looked at them and said, I just want to remind you that Republicans vote on Tuesday and Democrats on Wednesdays. The three young people, must have been Democrats, stood up and walked out and never came back. Jesus loved beyond the boundaries created by people to keep people safe. And in the process, he healed, he fed the hungry, he welcomed strangers and sinners and carousing party goers. He even reached out to tax collectors and women and foreigners. Jesus wasn't thinking outside God's box. Jesus was revealing how very much bigger God's box is for those who need God the most. P.S. Taking the Sabbath so that we are all able to worship and rest and renew is a good thing. And it's a way of creating space to trust God and to stretch our own souls. It is practicing, I believe, a little bit of heaven right here and now. And when we stretch our assumptions about ourselves, about our church, about our community, we can welcome God's largesse into our lives. I pray that God will help us to do so. May it be so. Amen. stand as you are able for the affirmation of faith. I believe in the living God, the joy of the universe, who is the pulse and purpose of all things seen and unseen, who is from the dust of earth, calls up living beings to be children of eternity, who through countless ages has provided us with many liberators and tirelessly seeking to bring victory 
out of defeat and life out of decay. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's true Son, who is bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, who took upon himself the healing of the human race, who bearing the burden of our sins went to Golgotha, carrying his cross, who was betrayed, crucified, dead, and buried in a borrowed tomb, who on the third day was found to be gloriously alive, meeting with those who trust him and serve him to the end of the world. I believe in the Holy Spirit of God, with the men among all who cherish Christ and his way who brings hope out of this life, love our apathy, and joy out of sorrow, who unceasingly regenerates and reforms the church, that it may always be the contemporary body of the risen Christ, loving the world to prayer, word, and deed. I believe that if you and I be caught up in the resurgence of life of Christ Jesus, and that nothing but life or death can separate me from his love and joy. In spite of unanswered questions, yes, I believe. Amen. You may be seated. There are a number of prayer requests in the back of your bulletin. I would ask you to pray for them. And I think you all probably received words that Rod's father died Friday afternoon. Um, we're, we're extremely sad and hurting for him. And at the same time, very grateful for the life that he lived. But please hold our family. We're traveling from Costa Rica to from California, um, from Pennsylvania to get to Mississippi for a service this week. So please pray for our family and pray for his wife, Joyce, who uh, is living for the first time in 71 and almost 72 years without her husband. Let us pray. Dear God, you call us to be your friends and to make friends of others, even more to recognize in them our brothers and sisters, your family in Christ. And so we pray for ourselves and for the world and its people. We pray for all areas in the world where deep divisions run between ethnic groups because of race, religion, or past history. Lord, help your people to be your friends and to make friends, your family in Christ. We pray for our communities where different traditions shape different outlooks on things. Lord, help your people to listen well to each other so that we may learn to live together knowing that though different, we are your family in Christ. And we pray for our own families where growing up can be difficult, where harsh words spoken in anger are not easily taken back, and where hurtful or thoughtless actions can endanger relationships. Lord, empower your people to be patient, slow to anger, and to become wise in speaking and acting as your family in Christ. And we pray for all those who are grieving, not only the family of Dan Chamberlain, but the families of people all over the world who have been killed or have died for reasons that we don't understand. Be with them, be with their loved ones, be with all of us. This we pray together, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the time in our worship service where you're invited to, to make an offering of words, and you're welcome to put a penny or something in the offering plate um, to praise God and thank God for what God has done. 
I have the two for today. <laughs> One is to thank the entire St. Paul's family for helping us reach the goal for our Liberia Mission Project. We certainly appreciate your generosity. And the second part of this is thanks to all who are on Team Stubish. You are a great group of people who get a lot of good stuff done. Well, I, I, I would put in one dollar and I'd actually have to put in $162 to symbolize the years of my father-in-law's life and his marriage together. It's a remarkable thing. 72 years of marriage in, on June 22nd and he will be 72. 92. Uh, yeah, 92. <laughs> yeah, he didn't get married when he was I would invite the others to bring the offering to the Lord. Please stand as you are able for the dark salvation.
country and in our world. And uh, there's anger and all kinds of things going on. There's lots of grief for many different reasons. And I think perhaps the best thing that we can do as God's followers is to dance this week. That we would, as we go about our business, that we see people, that we would smile, that we would use good words for people, that we would show that God is indeed the Lord of our universe. And so wherever you go this week, no matter who you are, it's my prayer that you will dance the dance of God. I'm sure that Jesus wants to dance with each of us.